obviously Jeannie is going to start with us. So I'm going to turn my video off because it's a little bit handier for people if you are on a um, on a iPad. So we're going to put Jeannie down um, because trying to do coaching coaching with a puppet is is a uh, bad enough with never mind having to do webinars. So you might see Jeannie later on. Uh, Anton, thanks for having me on and Anton Jay for the invite, kind of to take part um, in your coach development webinar series. Uh, for those of you who might know me as much, Antrim is my second county, thanks to my father being a proud Antrim Gale and having played in his youth with Gort and Amona. Um, so I'm excited to be chatting to you here this evening. Um, also, thanks for all of you to kind of jumping on the session, really appreciate it. As you can see, uh, kind of Jeannie is now sleeping here beside me. So I'm going to get started. So obviously the webinar is called To Play or Not To Play. Now, just before I do go on any further, um, I want to kind of get to know your needs and your wants and your ways. So using the chat function, um, if you could let me know what you want to get from this webinar or what you're hoping to get, or if you have an idea in your head about what I might be discussing, why did you sign up for the webinar? Did Anton or your club send out a forceful email? Um, I know they probably didn't, but you never know. And what are you hoping to gain from this session? So I'll be engaging with you kind of throughout the webinar and I'm not trying to catch you out. Um, if you're comfortable putting into the chat function, that's brilliant. If not, it's okay. All I ask is that you kind of have a notepad and pen in front of you. So again, in the chat function, what do you want from this webinar? Uh, why did you sign up? What are you hoping to get from the session? And Anton will feed back. So is there anything coming in the minute, Anton, or is it uh, like tumbleweed? <laughs> Got the tumbleweed moving across there. I want to <laughs> Class. Again, folks, you might have an idea of what I'm, what I'm going to discuss, and obviously it is about play, but what I hope, the kind of my reason for um, that little task, and again, for asking of that question, because I'm always curious, just like Mindy and Animaniacs, I'm always asking why, um, and if you remember Animaniacs, Mindy and Bubbles, her dog, get into loads of scrapes from her uh, kind of, her curiosity, but also the way she asks questions, she'll ask about four ways, and I'll do the same. I'll ask why several times until I realize that the person I'm asking is getting more exacerbated, more angry, steam blown out of their ears. And I won't do what Jeannie or what Mindy does. I won't say, OK, I love you, bye bye, and then be back to cuteness. I will think, reflect, and then maybe go to a more purposeful question. Um, and when the, because of my curiosity and because of asking questions all the time, I'm not trying to be difficult. Similar to this webinar, I'm not by engaging with you and asking you questions. I'm not trying to be difficult, even though um, that has been the impression I've given sometimes in the past. I just want to know why. I want to gain a better understanding of what I'm doing, what you're doing, how you're doing it, and obviously why you're doing it. So because of that sentiment, you know, as you see, problems and questions come before solutions and answers. This webinar is a mix of kind of research-backed insights um, and my own coaching experiences and reflections to help you think about who you're coaching, why play matters, kind of a better understanding of what play is, um, and tips on how you can incorporate play into your coaching um, practices and with your with your teams, whatever age group that you're working with. Um, you'll take what you want from this webinar. But again, as I say, my aim is to kind of get you to reflect on what you're doing and leave you with more questions and answers. Because what works for me or Anton or Paul or Neil or Aidan or anybody else on the call might not work so seamlessly for others. So it depends on your context. And because of that, again, um, I hope that you gain a few what if or I wonder questions. Um, and, you know, maybe I wonder if that would work in my context or would that work with the group that I'm working with or if I tried it like this instead of like this, how would that work? And that's what I want to kind of gauge with you this evening. Um, so I won't be giving you a list of takeaways um, at the end of this of what you should do, because I feel that those takeaways would be my takeaways from the session of what I think your takeaways should be. And I feel that that would be telling you what to do. Um, I don't tell people what to do, even like whatever age they are. Um, I like 
I like to kind of probe and guide and collaborate and reflect and embrace the chaos that kind of might come. Um, and more often than not, that create that chaos is created, which causes its own challenges. But again, it's my context. It's um, how I coach. And you'll take away what you feel is best for you, your players, your fellow coaches, and hopefully your teams. And the model that you see um, on the screen is um, from Andy Abraham, Dave Collins, and Bob Muir. And it's just a, a good theoretical model in terms of it's helped me in terms of my own decision making um, of how I make sense of how I coach through the medium of play as well as games. As Anton we, we, have, we, we yeah. have a couple in there, Owen. Uh, we have a few people in. Uh, Kieran was saying it's basically to open his mind a bit more uh, in regard to why he's here, I suppose. A few people are looking at maybe picking up some new tricks or more coaching ideas. Um, and then with Michal there, who has asked, or is, is basically looking at how to convince more traditional coaches to buy into the importance mm -hmm. and value of play as a key part of the coaching toolbox. I think you can guess who the teacher is in that one. Deadly. <laughs> Class. So that there kind of lends itself, and that's a good reflection of kind of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover a few other things, but again, it's your context. So what you take out of it will be, you know, what you're thinking in terms of how it might affect your practice. And as Anton touched on, these are kind of the four main research questions that I'm looking at in terms of my own research. Um, and there is a gap in the research that I feel in terms of play in sport. There's loads on play-based learning. And the teachers on the call will know about that in terms of uh, learning through play, educational based, psychological based, behavior, psychology, occupational therapy. And when you look at it through sport, technically play and games, arguably, sport is play. And therefore, you know, everything in a coaching session could be classed as play. I emphasize the word could. So I'm gonna, gonna touch on that a little bit more later on. Um, but again, what I want to try to do this evening is to kind of plant some seeds that will kind of assist your understanding of play and your perceptions on play, which hopefully later on will kind of being selfish will uh, allow me to kind of when I read back on the chat and all the questions that I'm going to ask you, I'll have a better understanding of where you are in terms of your own understanding perceptions of play. So there's always a rationale and the method of the madness and everything I do. So. Again, another chat function task. Um, so this is the second one. Obviously, use the chat function. The first word that pops into your head that you associate with children. And Anton will feed back. Um, now, one word, first word that pops into your head, put in the chat function. Um, Anton's going to feed back again, but uh, it doesn't. Most of the time, this is going to be positive. However, obviously, working with children is can be very challenging sometimes. So you might want to think about some of those words. So again, Anton, anything that's coming in, you can kind of shout. Yeah, some interesting ones. One's fun, uh, another is sponge. Mm. Um, enjoyment, hectic. Now it says hectic. Um, development, somebody else said. Class. Excellent. And I like that hectic one because it's it can be chaos, it can be positive, it can be challenging. And obviously working with children is that. So brilliant guys. And the, again, the reason for my rationale, why I'm doing that, to gauge your needs and your wants is anytime I'm coaching and when you're coaching through play or games or as a coach, being person-centered should be at the top of the tree and why you're a coach. And the age groups that I work with all the time, three to seven-year-olds and or adults, um, I'll do workshops and sessions kind of with other age groups but I will not coach them for a season. For example, it's always three to seven year olds or adults or three to seven year olds and adults, which kind of happens a lot. Um, and there's a few reasons for this. Enjoyment and crack uh, being the main two. <laughs> but the other one being the opportunity to have a go, try new things, lots of trial and error and working with adults or children. But as a coach, obviously I'm an adult, I'm an adult child, but that trial and error problem solving is the easiest way that I can describe play for adults. So when you're trying to figure something out or you're not sure about anything, having a go at it, that is play. And we'll discuss more about that later on. Um, so I can try things out with children that I'll do with adults and vice versa. Sometimes I'll just see, do something with a child and then I'll think, oh, I wonder if that's going to work with the adults. I'll do the same just to see what happens for a bit of crack more than anything. Um, but development comes before everything. 
um, whether it's an adult team winning is a long way down the list of priorities. It's their game, it's their team, it's their learning. Now that doesn't say I want, I don't want to win or they don't want to win, but there is a balance that I have. Um, we're all competitive. I'm extremely competitive as are three-year-olds, as are, is everybody. But it's about that balance and that learning and that development. So what I want to do all the time is to kind of create a love for the game and a love for what they're doing to come back all the time to your sessions, um, to be involved in the club, involved in the community, to stay and play with Antrim GA or whatever your club is. Um, and the best way I can kind of describe that person-centered approach is Netflix. So it's the most person-centered platform. But the fact that everything is related to the person's profile. So if my wife watches something on my profile that I don't watch, that's obviously going to affect every single thing that I watch then because um, what she has watched is then going to pop up. Oh, you might like this because you watch this, whereas I didn't watch it because she might have watched it. So in the sense of coaching, when you're thinking about that, it's the same. So everything should be relational to the person that you're coaching. So I'm not coaching footballers or hurlers or camogie players in my eyes. I'm coaching people who happen to play Gaelic football, hurling or camogie. So the person is always first. In relation to Sega or Nintendo or whatever you played in, whatever you played when you were younger, I'll touch on that a little bit later on about how I make sense of the research using Sega. So in a, in a nuts, and bolts, nuts and bolts of things. So why play? Why play matters? You can see the quote on the screen. You can read it as you like. Lev Vygotsky, I'll go into more detail about him later on. Some of the teachers on the call and some of the people who might have read about some of the theory about play and learning and children and child development. If you have, great. If not, I'll discuss more about him later on. Um, but play is very difficult to define and that's what I'm trying to do at the minute. But it's a complete minefield and a com it is complete chaos. But Dr. Stuart Brown, um, he wrote a uh, kind of play, How It Shapes the Brain, Opens the Imagination and Vigorates the Soul. Great book. It's kind of like my encyclopedia for play for children, but for adults as well. And he says that kind of trying to define play, because play is a thing of beauty, defining it is like explaining a joke, analyzing it takes the joy out of it. And with us, play can be constant. So how children learn about the world and their surroundings is through play. And all the people on the call who are parents, if you're not a parent, if you have uh, younger nieces or nephews and you watch them growing up or you have babysat and toddlers and babies, you'll know that when they kind of um, start off, they're laying down, then they'll do a bit of tummy time, they'll try and turn over, they'll sit up, they'll bump shuffle, they'll shuffle across the ground, they'll crawl, they'll pull themselves up, they'll then fall, they'll balance, they'll walk, then they'll fall, they'll run. Then they'll fall a lock. And, and in the case of Anton's uh, daughter, I know that she's uh, on her bike. So hopefully she's not falling, but she's doing a bit of rough and tumble play, um, a bit of trial and error and um, a bit of creativity and imagination and having a go. So that is so important. And all of that is kind of when it's children, it's done without kind of a conscious decision making or understanding what they're doing and why they're doing it. They just do it. It's just in their nature to do it. And to me, that is play. It's the art of being free and just doing it without thinking and without understanding what I'm doing. It's about exploration, enjoyment, opportunity, understanding, so many things, connections, a bit of skill acquisition, a lot of it as well in terms of sport and play. Collaboration with the parents or your fellow coaches or the club, but especially the, player, the players that is in your care. The social relationships that that comes with also get to know them creating a positive environment for them to thrive and enjoy themselves it's all person development it's fun but again in the context of my coaching again a love for the game the sport the club environment especially and then the community because everything links in and play has a really uh, foundational embedded process within that now again a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about later on in your coaching, you're all doing play within reason, maybe unconsciously. And we'll discuss more on that later on. But what I want to, on that slide, is just to get a gauge or help you a little bit in terms of your understanding of play. But again, it's a complete minefield, complete minefield. Another one in relation to rights. So another reason kind of the play is that kind of they have, children have a legally enshrined right to play. 
and it's guaranteed in international law from the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, this came in in 1989, um, and the two rights, as you'll see on your screen, is Article 31, which is the right to play. Um, it's their game, not ours. So Article 31 kind of recognises the importance of play, obviously, but that it's self-directed by the children for the children. And us as coaches or teachers in the school setting, you're facilitating that. And I go into a little bit more in a detail in terms of how, how you can do that collaboratively with the children. And Article 12 is the right to be heard. Ask the children their views, ask them what they want, ask them what they need. Children have their own views, experiences, perspectives. And a lot of you on the call, whether you have children or whether you're involved in coaching children, or your nieces, your nephews, your cousins, people, you children that you babysit, if you ask them a question, they're going to tell you an answer. Might be related to what you're coaching, but again, they'll give you their opinion. <laughs> and that's is so important to ask them that because it comes back to whether you're working with children or adults, it's nothing about us without us. So give them you know, that sense of belonging and responsibility by asking them, whether it's asking them how they feel or asking them what they want to do or making up their own games and children can do that. It's about how we facilitate that and how we kind of balance their wants, but also with their needs. And in terms of sport, that comes back to tactical awareness, skill acquisition. So it is a balancing act. And I'll go into a little bit more detail later on in terms of negotiation and kind of uh, crowd control and behaviour management and how that can impact on your coaching too. But I'll kind of pose this question in relation to the rights of the child. So can we kind of all be play friendly as coaches, as adults, in policy? Um, and again, you might be thinking that yourself, we could, I would say absolutely. And even long before the current pandemic, like physical play, kind of needed to be halted, or sorry, physical play, the decline in physical play, sorry, need to be halted and reversed. And several countries kind of have embedded play policies, not only in their sport, but also in society. And closer to home, Scotland has recently launched a play manifesto, and Aidan Burns and everyone at Playboard NA are doing some brilliant work in terms of building a greater awareness on play. Um, not only in the school setting, but at home with their friends in sport. And again, that is so important. And going back to kind of in terms of society, Sweden and Norway have introduced kind of these rights into their sport and practice. So if you just have a little kind of think about that and how that can impact, if that was the, be the case here, how that might impact on your coaching and what it says. And for me, Sweden and Norway, what it kind of says about what they think play is, is that they understand that it's about the child. The child is the focal point of everything. The sport, the coaching session, the club, what you're trying to do, not the coach. Um, it's the child's agenda, and that's what play is. It's about them. So looking into that, and again, there's rationale for what I'm doing here. So the first poll is going to be launched now, and Paul is going to launch the poll in a little second. But before he does that, all the polls that I'm launching are, sorry, the poll launches later on. Paul's one of our interns at Dublin GA, and everything's anonymous. So nobody, not even myself or Anton or Paul, will know who voted for what. All we get is a percentage. And again, it gives me a better understanding of when I look back at the chat function and I engage with kind of reflections on the session for myself, you know, where each of you are and where the group was in terms of their own coaching practices or where they were in terms of their own thinking. So be honest. Um, it's just to give me a flavor kind of of where you might be. So on your mobile, if you're on a mobile or a tablet, you might have to go into the chat function to access the polls. If you're on a laptop, it'll pop up straight in front of you. So Paul, if you want to launch the first one, um, so you will see folks, the first one is on age groups and what age group do you coach? This is multiple choice. So for me, it would be three to six year olds or sorry, three to seven year olds and adults. I will hit and then I'll hit submit. So hit your answer, hit submit and that's it. It's had to rhyme, so the poet and I didn't know it. Um, so again, just to give me an idea of where the group is in terms of their coaching and who they're coaching. Um, so Paul, whenever again, roughly about half the people are 
have launched or have voted and submitted. You can vote yourself, same as Anton, and then you can launch the second one. So the second one then is in relation to play types, and that's the next slide. So if you're aware of play types, or if you're not, I don't really care because it's just uh, one answer from a possible three. So Paul, if you want to launch the second one. So yeah, I think there might have been a little bit of a, a, a fault with the first one. I only said to retry. Um, okay. I'll okay. try well, launch the second one here and see. Okay. Uh, people maybe want to type into the chat function and let you know if they can see yeah. them. Cool. So if Paul does launch that one, hopefully it's okay. Um, it's how yeah, many play types are there? Is that okay? Yeah, that's come up. Yeah. Great. Okay. So uh, it's eight, sixteen, or twenty-four. So again, fast finger first, vote, hit submit, done. All right. So I'll give you a few seconds because I'm going to give the answer in the next slide. So again, Paul, when kind of three quarters of the people have voted, vote yourself, and then um, I'll go on to the next one and um, I'll give people the answer. So another five seconds, and then. So again, fast finger first, and then hit submit. So the answer of the play types is 16. Now, the reason why I picked this play types is from Bob Hughes, and it's the play workers taxonomy on play types. Now, there is of other play and sport play types that I'm kind of looking at, and I specifically haven't looked at them because I just want to give you an overview of play, not only in sport, but in terms of your own understanding of play. So this is the next one, all right? So this here might come in a little bit of what me and Anton talked about earlier on. So Anton, I want you to think about your daughter in this one and her games in terms of uh, her castle game that I saw on the St. Gaul's Facebook page the video uh, and everybody else. Um, it doesn't have to be in your coaching. Um, so how many of the play types would you use in your coaching? There's 16, as you can see. But it doesn't have to be in your coaching. If you're kind of if you're watching children, uh, relations playing outside, your nieces, nephews, cousins, children, your babysit, when they're making up games or when they're playing with each other or having a go at something or trying to figure something out, how many play types might you see? All right. So, uh, Paul, if you want to launch that one, and hopefully that one comes up, and it should be one to three, if I'm not mistaken, four to six, seven to ten, or eleven to sixteen. Um, you can take uh, a couple of seconds to kind of think about it. Um, Anton, if you want to kind of come in on this um, and if you want to uh, have a think about your daughter and what you would have seen in terms of thinking back to what she was doing and in terms of what you see on the screen. So again, not trying to put you under any pressure, but how many of those play types would you have been looking at? So it's just a bit of in the context for people on uh, the... We obviously will work, we're doing a few different things in regards to coaching kids uh, and a colleague of mine, Alfie Hannaway, was doing a bit of uh, athletic development for, for, for players and Aoife had come in and asked me, what's, what's Alfie doing? And I said to him that he's coaching uh, your friends online, so anybody that plays GA Taylor or, or her friends, anybody playing Gaelic games, uh, and she says, well, I want to coach my friends. So I says, well, look, why don't you become the coach for the day and you make up a game? Um, and and so she did. Uh, she she went ahead and she she said, "Well, I'm going to make up this game," and she made up this game. And I said, "Right, so what we have to do then is we have to go online with them, uh, and you're going to have to tell them how to play the game." So of course, then she thought this was the best thing ever. She thought, "Right, I'm I'm now the coach," uh, and I'm not sure now that could be the dramatic side of play to it, um, or the role play if you like, yeah. where where she's coming the coach, um, and she's coaching then her friends how to play this game. And it's actually turned out really well. And a, a friend of mine's on here, Terry. Terry also coaches in, in the team as well. And Terry will tell you, we've now had, I think, three or four different kids now come in and, and show us all game in, in the club WhatsApp group, the under six WhatsApp group. Um, so, so now it's a knock-on effect where instead of us coming in or senior players coming in and showing our under sixes how to, how to do it, we've actually had now all the, the three, four, five, six-year-olds coming in and telling each other how to play a certain game. Uh, and then they're telling each other the coaching points. Um, it, it, it's it's been more effective than anything else we've tried because of the amount of videos and that we're getting in and responses I'm getting from parents on the side too. Um, so it's been brilliant. And I'd say there are the role play, the possibly the communication play, mm -hmm. um, the the imaginative play in regard to what she's doing, even the exploratory play as well, uh, and the creative play because essentially she made it up. 
Mm-hmm. So I suppose there's, there was a fair amount of different types of play within that. And and that's whenever whenever I seen that video, it was popped in my head because we'll be going into a little bit more detail later on. But as I said, the magic principles and kind of those different roles, and the fact that your daughter is just about turned four, she's become a coach. She's helping her players. She's helping her friends. She's you know explaining her own game. She's able to talk and she's able to give her views, and that comes back to the rights of the child, letting them at it. Collaborative play they'll go into later on. So you're definitely sitting at 11 to 16. But again, it depends on your context. If people have put in one to three, that's fine. Um, again, it's on your context. But I don't want to explain all of the play types. Um, I just kind of want you to have a think about well, what it might be. And that's what coaching is. And that's what kind of trial and error is, is reflecting on, oh, I wonder what that is. And then thinking about it and then having a go at it. Um, that's the deep play, the rough and tumble play. Um, I know that. She's doing that a little bit, as I said, with her bike. <laughs> in terms of uh, the road, this rough and tumble, if she does fall, and the deep play is more dangerous. However, um, it is a play type, but I wouldn't have it included in in kind of in sport and sessions because obviously we want to keep them safe. But again, it is one of the play types that Bob Hughes talks about. And out of the sixteen, when I was looking at my research and how it would fit in with sport, there's thirteen to fourteen of them that would. Um, tick a box, tick all boxes in terms of sport. So 14 out of the 16, I would use kind of during sessions. Now, don't use all 14 all the time, but you can see how they overlap and how they interlink with each other. So that was class, and it's great to get that context and that kind of real life exposure and everything kind of that you're you're doing here, uh, that your daughter is doing. And I want you and your kind of you, Anton, and the coaches to think about this. What I'm going to talk about now in terms of Scott Eberl, and he talks about that there are six basic elements of play that are present each time someone plays fully. So if you're thinking of your daughter, that's great. You can think of it as a child or you can think of it as a coach. So whatever way your context is, I'm going to think of it a little bit of both, and I'll give you a few reasons why. So the first one is Buzz Lightyear, anticipation. So getting to infinity and beyond, and that kind of expectation that wonderment of what's to come as a child you're excited as a coach you're wondering uh, what the weather's going to be like who's coming to your session so that wonderment is always there so that buzz light year kind of analogy is very strong especially before you leave the house then your second one then is kind of tom and jerry and this is where the next two kind of could be either or so i'm going to go with the child so i'm going to go for uh kind of pleasure and surprise, but a positive surprise. So the unexpected or a new discovery, a new friend, a new idea, a new word, whatever that is. But as a coach, that surprise could be that you've loads more coming to your session that you weren't expecting, or you don't have enough. (laughs) Or the weather is poor and you thought the weather was going to be better or you're locked out of the club, whatever that is. But again, that element of surprise is always there. Next one then is buzz, uh, a bug, sorry, and uh, you're looking at pleasure. And again, it could be pleasure or fear or anxiety. Um, but I'm going to go with pleasure first. So that satisfaction, happiness, fun. But initially and ultimately, you know, knowing that you're having a positive impact. And as a coach, you know, your sessions aren't going to go well the whole time. You're going to have difficulties. You're going to have challenges, just like the players, just like the children. But that pleasure and that enjoyment from learning. Um, and that having kind of um, got over hurdles, as I'll go into a little bit more detail later on, and the pleasure of knowing that you didn't give up, or, you know, because then that leads to understanding. So the aha moment, and, you know, it could be, this is where we can come into a little bit of skill acquisition. So new knowledge or a new skill or a new concept that you previously, as a player, couldn't do or you found very difficult but you went home and practiced or you were doing the play practice play or whole part whole within your session and then you got it and you thought yes that's how i'm going to do that or yes it just it just clicks so then that then leads to yoda and leads to strength and then for me making sense of again of the research yoda would be mastery and he epitomizes strength and character and skill you know for me but that comes from understanding and as a player and as a coach, you know, that understanding of a new concept or, you know, having um, had a chance of 
players learning and developing and moving up through the age grades and you give them those tools to move up through the age grades but also to learn and develop and improve their skills and play through games and but that they're practicing at home and they're you know because you as a coach you don't have long with them so that element of parent engagement deliberate play deliberate practice i'll go into a little bit more detail now later on but that kind of fits in here in terms of um how you could get parents involved and players involved and practice their skills or you know their skill challenges at home and again go back to anton's daughter what she did in anton's living room um that is strength or sorry surprise pleasure understanding strengths all in and then the poise that i seen in that video in terms of her contentment and kind of fulfillment and you know her composure of actually explaining the game and you know what the game was and the demonstration of the game that she has reached poise straight away so she's went through all of these stages and anton has went through all of those as a parent but also thinking as a coach and um, all those stages have been hit now what scott Everlane talks about is that once poise is hit that you go back and you're ready to go on that kind of roller coaster again but as we know development isn't linear so you don't have to go back to buzz all the time you might start at bugs um it might be a skill that you're able to do but you just need a little bit extra help a little bit extra collaboration and assistance and kind of um a assistance under sorry support from the coach and your coaches or your friends um because for me kind of this is all about patience coaching is about patience and about small steps and again trying to make sense of the research um i'm going to look at in terms of this this is the sport and play continuum and it's mainly education based theory but i've kind of adapted it um to coaching and the sport in terms of my own context um and i'll go into a little bit more detail in the next two slides in relation to a ga context or sorry, a play, practice play context and how I coach and what I would do, but also in terms of a GA context. Um, but in terms of the middle part, so sustained shared thinking and doing and the zone of proximal development, I'm going to focus on that. And that focus or zone of proximal development um, is from Lev Vygotsky that you have seen his quote earlier on. And um, very much in terms of education-based collaboration and scaffolded learning, and the teachers on the call and even parents on the call kind of working with your child or working with the child in the classroom in the case of sport player and coach working together so challenging each other questioning giving choice support all that learning but you're building up the levels and you're moving from three and four years of age and you can go back to anton's daughter moving up the levels and then at under 12 those levels are hit in terms of skill acquisition the needs the topical awareness width, depth, all of that done through games and play, but again, done through support with the coach and the player together, but also the coach and the parents working together, the club and the school working together, the community and Antrim GA working together. So it's all about those links and how they link in with each other. And in terms of SEG, it's kind of, you know, you're building and maintaining trust in that so that if it's too easy, that you're maybe being more purposeful in terms of setting an additional challenge. Um, and it's too hard, you know, you, it's small steps. So bring them back a little level and then trying to, you know, scaffold that learning so that they can move up and that they can beat the big boss and move on to the next level. And now doing this through play and this is kind of how I look at it and coaching is a partnership type thing. So question and asking and what I talked about earlier on about how I coach and I do coach through questions and it is chaos a lot of the time people who on the call know me and how we're coaching and we show you a video in particular um and it's a video that i kind of always use but it's it gives you a good rationale of where i'm coaching but i'll give you the stages before that um and how i coach has its pitfalls and challenges <laughs> it's not perfect and it's extremely difficult sometimes but it's enjoyable for me because i um, i enjoy it i i enjoy the crack i enjoy kind of how they're learning and again watching what happens and standing back and seeing how they can figure things out but again it's all done in a safe environment um and as i said coaching is a partnership so rather than kind of instructional telling 
um, it's kind of a presentation kind of to the children that I'm working with, you know, so asking questions and posing problems and setting up games and they set up the games. And again, there it's constant negotiation. <laughs> and that's one thing that um, my friend and mentor, um, one of my many mentors, uh, Professor Richard Cheatham discusses, is he brought in a hostage negotiator into one of his uh, university sessions. <laughs> and it goes back to kind of what I'm going to discuss a little bit later on about that constant um, kind of collaboration and getting the children to think that this is what you're doing when really you know that it's something else, but then thinking it's this and then you getting what you want out of it because you're uh, they think it's that something else. So that constant uh, to and, and fro and, and okay, well, I'll give you this if you give me this or I'll ask you this question because I want this and they'll make up their games because they want to, it's their wants. But then I'm kind of guiding them towards what I think they need without telling them. And again, it's a complete balancing act and a seesaw all the time, which is very difficult in fairness. Um, but knowing your group is essential in all of this so again, behavior management, kind of crowd control, but there's a rationale for everything that I do and a purpose to everything that I do. So in terms of kind of uh, myself and how I coach show, um, I'm going to discuss play, practice, play. And again, it goes back to kind of what you've seen earlier on, discovery, collaborative and purposeful. And it's very similar to whole part whole. Um, so in terms of the first stage, so discovery, coming in, letting them at it, um, children and best kind of when they experience periods of unstructured play. However, it's unstructured in the fact that, sorry, it's it is unstructured, but it's structured because they're safe mainly. And I'm may putting them in, maybe putting them into teams or giving them a ball, showing them what um, what can you do. Uh, but again, it's it's around safety. Now they can basically do what they want as long as they don't hurt themselves or punch the heads of each other. Because what I want to do is create that kind of social emotional connection um, with myself, but with the club, with their friends. Um, and generally it is, I do let them at it and see what happens. Um, but I need help and support in that for your other coaches with the parents. And at six to seven, six or sorry, three to seven age, that's a lot easier. As they get older, that might be uh, the children helping me as many coaches. And you'll see that no matter what age they are, as Anton's, Anton's daughter being an example, children can be many coaches. And again, I'll go into a little bit more detail on that later on. So it's on this as well, that there may be children and players who are uncomfortable of, of being let at it, you know, and of being afraid to kind of try something new. So by getting that sense of giving them the ball, seeing what they can do, if they're just walking around holding the ball, then that maybe gives me a sense of, okay, well, they might need a little bit more assistance or um, they might want me to go over and ask them how they are and what they're doing and they might need a little bit of extra support. Whereas Anton is flying, Anton has the ball and he's kicking it against the wall and catching it and moving and using the balloon, whatever he's doing. But again, they're not all children, not all players are like that. So again, it comes back to knowing your group when you do that and you have an idea of you know, playing practice, so you're doing whole part and discovery and collaborative, this here is kind of, kind of activities that are uh, game-like and a lot of problem solving, posing questions, giving them, setting up their teams and them coming up with games or them coming up with scenarios or you set the scenario and they have to problem solve or at half time in a game, you might ask them, listen, I want you to decide and have a chat about what you think as a team that you did well in the first half and what you might need to do better in the second half and then stand back and see what happens. So that's collaborative play practice, but play is kind of the core element of the sessions that I do and the core element of everything that I do, but it's not the be all and end all. You know, there is going to have to be practice, deliberate practice, practicing your skills at home, but I like to do it through games and through different scenarios and scoring points and playing against somebody or playing against another team. And, and there's different ways of doing that. And I'll look at that in the next slide. And then the final one in terms of the play practice, play whole part, whole discovery, collaborative, purposeful, is then this comes back to kind of more about their needs and kind of checking about 
they're learning in terms of the previous play practice element. So can they transfer the free play or unstructured play at the start or the free play game that they made up into maybe the handling skill or um, the handling concept or whether it's width or depth, can they put that into a game then in terms of tactical scenario? Um, and you know, whenever this is happening, if you as a coach have an idea, okay, well, this is what I want to do here in the in the final whole part or you know, the play, the purposeful end and what I want them to do, if you don't see it in the last part here, then don't just stop it and, and make sure it, it happens. Just take a step back, let it let it go, let it flow, let the game flow. And then you might come in and ask them a question or stop the game and guide them in terms of what might happen in terms of um, maybe what you think they want might be different than obviously what you think they need. And that's kind of where the play and games and deliberate play, deliberate practice can be difficult. Um, if you don't see what you hope to see, you know, ask the children or ask the players and maybe be more purposeful then. And again, depending on the age and depending on their ability and depending on their behaviour, that's easier said than done in some instances. So coming to the GA context and from the previous two slides in terms of my descriptions and I want you to think now about your own context and think about these three approaches. So similar, same approaches to the, the Sego um, collaborative or sorry, play continuum and the previous one. So discovery, collaborative and um, purposeful. Play, part, play, whole, part, whole, right? Now, I'm going to give you three scenarios and three approaches to how I would go about things. And again, this is your context. So think about you and kind of where you are and what you would do in your coaching session. And this picture is me and Anton were talking earlier on before the call started about Terence McWilliams. And I know that Terence is a mentor of Anton. He's a mentor of mine as well. And uh, this picture came from a a webinar that I did with Terence before and I told him I was kind of taking it. I was obviously going to give him credit, but the approaches that I'm going to talk about relates to this picture, but again to my coaching. So the first one is discovery. So as I said, show me what you can do with the ball, have a go, see what happens. Here's a piece of equipment, right? Or I put them into groups of four, give them an area, give them equipment and have to make up their own games. Each of them kind of has two minutes. Whatever they decide, the rest of the group um, has to take part in their game. So me, Paul and Anton and Emma. So us four, I'm the leader, so I make up the first game. Paul, who comes second, he was picked, he was put second in the group. So Paul can make a completely new game or Paul can add in a rule into my game. So then we can have either two separate games or one game with an extra rule. Anton can do the same. He can make a completely new game or add in another rule to the first game, or he can add in a rule to Paul's game. So again, the, the players have a lot of freedom in this, but it's discovery, seeing what happens, how they interact with each other. There being many coaches, there can be many referees, they can work the group whatever way they want. So that's the discovery approach in terms of my own coaching. Collaborative. So let's say this here uh, session is set up in the hall or whatever it is on the pitch, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just an example. So I put them into their groups, and I give each person and each group um, a game and activity that you see on the screen. Now, Anton, uh, his group is down at 4v4 endurance runs. Uh, I, my group is at sprint relay. Paul's group is at agility skills. And Emma's group is up the top at shoulder tackle. And Neil Quigley, who's on the call as well, I see Neil from my own club in Esseski, is at 4v4 kicking. Now, the groups go there. I don't tell them that that's the games. I know that that's the games. The coaches know that's the games. But the collaborative approach is they cannot change the later as a game or activity, but they need to work with each of the people in their group, think about what ideas they can come up with, and maybe have a think about what they think is in my head. So their game has to be related to how the game is set up originally. They can't change it. They can't move the equipment, but they can use it in any way they want. They just can't move it. Now, Seven or eight times out of 10, they don't do what I have in my head, as you'll see on the screen. That's fine. That's where then I can be more purposeful. So I can say to Neil, um, Neil's group of before V4 kicking, or the coach can, 
and say, uh, can you play 6v2 or 3v1 or 4v4 or 2v2 or 1v1, whatever it is in your group. Um, and chances are they'll come up with that because once they see mini goals and once they see a ball and once they see maybe a, um, a mini hurl or even if they're using their hands, they'll not be long doing, okay, me and Anton, I'm playing against Anton, we're playing goals, that's the game. And that will happen sometimes. But if you don't get do that, that's when you can be more purposeful. And you can do that through collaborative, but going back to then, apologies, let me move on to the purposeful approach. So again, new session, it's set up like this. I take all the children around and explain every single game, it takes about a minute, let them know what our age group is, maybe do a little demo for the harder games. I go back to the very start, which is endurance runs, and then I scratch my head and I go, oh, I can't remember. What do we do here? I forget. And then Kira sticks her hand up and Kira goes, oh, this is endurance runs, uh, but we have to chase each other and we have to kind of race all the people in our group. Brilliant. Kira, you're the captain for endurance runs. Go to the sprint relay. Oh, what are we doing here again, children? I can't remember. Anton sticks his hand up. That's a no. That's grand. And then the move and rotate around. But the coaches stay where they are because then the coaches can be more purposeful in terms of uh, depending on the ability of the children, they might make it more challenging. They might make it a little bit more easier. They might add in different skills. And that's the coaches kind of thinking for themselves, whether they're new parents. Um, and you'll see that there's one coach, one C for each age group, roughly. But that doesn't say that you can't have a new parent give an Anton a hand or um, giving another coach a hand that might be struggling. And again, it goes back to kind of crowd control and crowd management you know, nudging the parents, oh, we give, will you give the coach a hand here today? And if they say no, that's fine. But the fact that there is great. If they're there the following week, ask them again. And then again, they might say yes, they might say no. But you'll see about how I can engage with the parents later on using these approaches. So the final poll. So all those three approaches. So Paul's going to launch the poll. And the poll is which one um, is related to you and your practice. If you're doing a session tomorrow, would it be discovery, collaborative, purposeful? Would it be a mix of two or would it be a mix of all three? So again, no right or wrong answers. This is your context um, and it's completely about your coaching practice. So Paul, if you want to launch there and you can vote yourself and then I'll kind of move on. So again, if you're, if you're when the poll is launched, um, if you don't see it, then you can go into the chat function and you can fast finger first, hit your answer and then hit submit. So again, it's anonymous. We only get a percentage and it gives me an idea at the end of about kind of your own thinking and thought processes, as well as that I kind of go over those approaches as well as I hope I did. But again, I'll, I'll watch back in the video and kind of um, I'll have a look at that. So the what you see on the screen terms the magic principles in your coaching and how you coach and through games or whether it's uh, purposeful or whether it's collaborative discovery asking questions the fact that your sessions are varied and fun you're increasing motivation and you want to create that kind of um, participation of, of activities and make them come back to your sessions but also that it's at the developmental level of the child so it's age appropriate however as I talked about before, I'll do some things with adults that I'll do with children and vice versa. I'll just make the space smaller. I'll use balloons instead of a O'Neill size five. So again, there was just kind of a little bit of trial and error in that. But the last three in terms of growth. So that comes back to the challenge and the collaborative and purposeful. So Anton and his daughter and she is able to challenge herself, challenge her friends, be a mini coach. And She's making up the games and it's always appropriate to her level because that's what she's doing. And if you give a player, whether they're 35 or whether they're three, if you give them a ball or a piece of equipment and all you said was show me what you can do, they're going to do something that they're comfortable with. And it'll happen all the time. That's a good idea and a good gauge of, okay, well, um, a three-year-old, so I'll give them a ball or a balloon, as you'll see in um, the video um, after the next slide. 
about you know what some people can't do and what they can't, but you can then be more purposeful in terms of their challenge. And then you're kind of being more inclusive because it's about them and it's about what they understand that they can do. But again, you're collaborating with them. You're asking the question, well, can you have a go at this? Or have you tried this? Or how would this feel? Or how do you feel doing this? Is it, uh, do you enjoy it? Is it difficult? And again, okay, well, can you change the game? Or can you think of a different activity if you're handling, if you're, sorry, if your theme was in handling and the people and the children were just using their feet with the ball, you'd be more purposeful and say, listen, children, that's brilliant. What you're doing was fantastic. Can you now show me what you can do using your hands? And again, they might be kicking out of the hands. They might be moving the ball along the ground with their hands. But again, it gives you an idea of what they can do and can't do. And the last one, then, per person-centered. So different brain positions, different aspects about, you know, attacking, shooting, scoring, um, being a goalkeeper, wherever they are, giving them uh, playing 1v1, 2v2, no matter what age they are. And small side of games all the time, but the different roles are really good. And again, um, we'll go back to Anton's daughter, apologies, but give them a chance to be mini coaches and to be mini referees and watch each other, observe their friends, ask them, okay, um, what's your group? So if you have three groups, two groups are playing, one group is sitting out for about 20 or 30 seconds, get the group, okay, one person, I want you to watch one person who's playing and just let me know what they're doing well. Now, they may watch them, they may look at the sky, depending on the age they are, and if they watch them, they watch them. But again, you're creating that element of, okay, well, we want you to think about observing and reflecting and thinking about what people are doing, watching your friends and being mini coaches and mini referees. And again, going back to the research, so Andy Abraham kind of talks about there's six areas and understanding the player comes back to that, understanding the sport, um, understanding the kind of pedagogy in terms of the learning and what how you're kind of, what your understanding is of learning and how you're gauging the learning of your players, the learning of the children, your context. So understand the age range of the children, what they can do, what they can't do, their needs and wants, um, how you're doing it, uh, what you're doing. And then obviously understanding yourself as a coach. So, you know, you might be comfortable with letting them at it, but ask them a question about a game or a scenario that you have posed is being uh, kind of person centered is through play and again there's it's a complete balance in acting it doesn't have to be children it can be adults and you'll see here in the video is this is the last face-to-face -face workshop that i did in for Hertfordshire ga and stephen uh, hill Harry is the uh, community development administrator he's the one sitting down in front of you and he got me in to do the session but you'll see they're all making up their own games and it's handling. However, uh, it's discovery and collaborative, but I am being more purposeful after this video because of Stephen and his partner. Um, and I'll just play the video again, no matter what they're doing, the different areas, uh, some of them are moving, as you'll see, some of them aren't. They have to score, they have to make up their own rules because the game is all about scoring. But again, my theme is handling. I don't care how they do it. And then some of them are doing more difficult games than others, but Stephen and his partner, they're sitting down. So all I did to be more purposeful after this was I walked across and said, Stephen, that's brilliant. What you and your partner are doing is brilliant. Can you now change your game that you're both standing? And then I can be more purposeful. Can you change your game so that you're moving? Because they're all using their hands. I know, so we don't even have to say, use your hands. And when it goes back to the research, um, that discusses about autonomous supportive environments. And um, Maggie and Valorant in 2003 talked about kind of the coach-player relationship. And this goes back to this video. So all my contacts in terms of discovery, collaborative and purposeful, there's a method to the madness. So this is about seven or eight weeks in before I moved back from New York. And it's again handling, but you'll see that there's so many adults there. There's fellow coaches, young coaches, um, there's balloons, everybody's moving. It, and you can't hear the sound, but there is that is so loud. But the parents, you'll see them. Um, some of them are involved, some of them are sitting down, but they're engaging with each other. And they didn't have to take part in the coaching, but they had to stay and get involved. And getting involved, if they didn't want to coach, meant that they had to talk to a new parent. So I wanted to create that sense of community, that connection to the club, 
through their child and they're getting that through their child, but also I want them to come and enjoy the sessions because they're making friends. It's not just about the children. It's about the adults as well, that they feel part of the community, that they feel part of what we're trying to do. And again, it comes back to kind of nothing about us without us. And that's children, coaches and parents. Um, so just finishing off the last couple of slides, and I talked earlier about patience and small steps. And, you know, again, games and skills and your own coaching practice, it's about freedom and exploring. Now, that can be through questioning or getting them to make up their own games. But they have to be safe. Um, there has to be a reason for what you're doing. But children um, and kind of coaches, that relationship, the coaches are the facilitator. So the coach is kind of like the environment designer and they're the designer of the environment and the children and the players are the game designers and the practice designers. But the coach is the facilitator of that and that hostage negotiation and that balance and that needs and wants and that constant kind of to and fro and is happening all the time. Um, and in terms of what you see is having patience and, you know, thinking about one thing at a time. So keeping it short and sweet, but that development is not linear, as I talked about earlier on. It's not a straight A to B. It's complete chaos. Creating a plan. I know Anton is creating his own plan about a few things and tracking that progress, tracking that plan is complete chaos. But taking your time, having patience, constantly reflecting on what you're doing and having a go at something. And not being afraid to make mistakes um, because that's what learning is and that's what coaching is. And, you know, the fact that you are coaches and the fact that you're here on a session, you know, you're already venturing outside your comfort zone. So you're all Rapunzel's. Um, coaching is very rewarding. Being a parent is very rewarding. Being working with children is very rewarding. Working with different people. But then to me, Maryland's what can I, is have a go at something. So... You know, I enjoy having a go at something, seeing what happens, throwing stuff at the wall, seeing what sticks. And I'm very comfortable at that. But that doesn't mean that, you know, if you don't do that, that you're not a good coach. Um, I'm comfortable doing that. However, you might be more purposeful as a coach. But if you're asking questions, get them to make up their own games, thinking about problems and problem scenarios and kind of making sure that they're constantly thinking and constantly thinking about what they're doing, how they're doing it, why they're doing it, and you as a coach doing that as well, you know, that then will get you out of your comfort zone, gets them out of their comfort zone, but that, you know, you as a coach are creating that environment of learning that mistakes are good, you make mistakes, your sessions are never going to be perfect, and that environment of learning and that environment of that connection with yourself as a coach, with them, but also with the club and you want them to come back. That's the main thing. You want them to stay with your club. You want them to stay with your team. After they finish playing, you want them to become a coach. You want them to become an administrator. You want them to get involved in events at the club. And that just doesn't happen with players or coaches. It's that con constant conveyor belt. And the children at three and four years of age of that are those guinea pigs. You know, so they're the foundation stage, the most important stage in my opinion, because then the parents are going to come in and, parents are going to stay with the club so if you're creating that positive environment and that kind of learning through play or through games and having a go at something and not creating that chaos and that element of collaboration and working with the players working with the children working with the parents you know that they feel a part of it that they feel a part of their session and again nothing without without us or sorry nothing with us without us last two slides is this year is from a hugely decorated uh, American footballer, NFL Pro Bowl, or sorry, NFL Hall of Famer, um, Mike Singletary. And if you ask the six-year-old, would they give a similar answer? And again, I just leave that with you. So favorite part of the game is the play. And for your own head, making time for play, getting involved in play, Making space for play is so important, and especially in the time that we're in with children, um, with the pandemic, and when they go back to their sessions, you know, not constraining them, you know, letting them out of them, you know, letting them go free, because we've all been constrained so much, and you know, play is not just about the children; it's about adults. We all enjoy play, 
and the trial and error, making decisions, problem solving is play as well. So a few um, resources um, in terms of what Anton and what Gail Fass and what Antrim G are doing um, in terms of the videos uh, of sessions, Special Olympics, in terms of inclusiveness, obviously uh, a guilt a guilt edge plug in terms of Dublin G and the resource in terms of games, Ulster G especially with the um, the Gaelic Star program um, that Ulster G were involved in and very lucky to be a part of that as well as obviously I coach kids. So what I would say is you know as you see on the screen is it's not just about kind of webinars like this, asking questions, getting critical friends, getting a mentor, you know, networking with other people. And having a go at it. Uh, these are the re references. You, know, you can read them if you want. They'll be in the PDF that I sent Anton. But what I do want to say is kind of keep things in perspective for yourself. Enjoy the journey. Embrace the chaos. And kind of remember it's their game and nothing with them without them. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope none of you are kind of feeling like Homer. Um, look forward to your questions. And, uh, and I'll just stop sharing my screen and I'll turn my camera on and I'll go back in the here. That. Cool. I'll turn it on. That's all, Santon. Thanks very much. Listen, uh, with, with respect to questions, if anybody's any questions, they want to put it into the chat box. Um, I can read them out to one and won't be happy to answer them. Um, I, I'll start off with one, if you don't mind. Uh, I suppose with, with everything that was in there, um, there, there's, there, is, there can be a lot to take in at times, mm -hmm. especially for people that are, are just coming maybe in as a parent and just want to learn a bit more and things like that. If you could give them one thing to try in their next training session, what would it be? Uh, a really, really good question. Um, I would you know, get them to put Put them into teams, two, three, four people, whatever you want. Give them a piece of equipment. Give them an area that is safe, that is either coned out, that's big enough, and then say, here's your area, make up your games. And then keep an eye on that. So make sure they're safe. But then you as a coach can, you know, ask them the question, well, how can you change the games? Or, you know, uh, Anton is the first person. You're making up the first game, Anton. I make up the second game. Paul makes up the third game and Kira makes up the fourth game and then okay well can you change the game now or can you make it that you're just using your hands or using your feet if you're not comfortable doing that set the games up bring them all around tell them demonstrate the games put them into other groups let them at it and get them to rotate around the games because then you're more comfortable you're watching you're observing you might be probing about what questions you might ask or what you know how they could change the game asking them that and that is play it's more purposeful but that element of free play and free ray and non-structured it is very kind of scary and fearful for a lot of coaches and even for me sometimes depending on the group but i won't do that if i don't know the group um if i don't know a group i will be more purposeful so i'll set the games up bring them all around put them in their groups and then say here's your games rotate around and then i'll observe how they're working with each other, how they're working with the coaches, what they're coming up with. And then I could make, oh, okay, Anton, you, know, you have a good grasp of this. So Anton, can you make up your own game for this group? So then you're kind of giving them that aspect of practice, play, game design, but then you're kind of collaborating and, and helping them out and supporting them and that scaffold of learning again. But definitely um, making sure they're safe is the biggest one. And if you're not comfortable putting them in their groups, just make sure you have enough equipment, loads of balloons, loads of balls, and listen, just here. You, here's your equipment. Be safe, watch each other, make sure you're not hurting each other, but show me what you can do. Um, and that's what you would have seen, Ken, in that video with Rockland, because that was the first time that I did that in so, with such a big group, and it was complete organized chaos. But because I had so much help, that definitely helped. So the more help you have, the better. Um, the more support you have with the parents or the coaches, but also, depending on the age group, you could have them looking after their own groups, you know, little captains, mini coaches. And you can do that with three and four year olds. Like your 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 daughter would definitely be a mini coach if I was doing a group of three and four year olds, Anton. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we had a question in the chat function there. Uh, we had Aiden. Aiden has asked there just 
how you'd go about engaging parents to get them involved in the sessions? So, good question, Aidan. And um, that video that you would have seen, uh, I didn't know how many were coming to that session. Um, I knew it was going to be complete chaos because of the previous sessions and the numbers had constantly got bigger and got bigger and the, the hall was very was quite big at the very start, but then the more people came in, obviously wasn't long, um, making that a lot smaller. So I just emailed them. Um, they knew that they had to stay. All the parents had to stay in every single session. If they didn't stay, they had to have a parent, an adult there. So let's say Anton's, Anton's daughter, good example. And um, Anton can't come to the session. And um, I don't have kids, but if it did, um, my kids would be, I'd be bringing the kids to the session. I'd be staying, but I would be bringing Anton's daughter and I would be the adult for Anton's daughter. So we'd rotate it every two weeks. That was fine. Um, it didn't have to be the parent of the child, but they had to stay. That was the main aspect of it. Now, we weren't full. We didn't say you have to stay and that's it and your child can't take part because things can happen and life happens. But we engaged them in a workshop and we brought all the parents in. If they wanted to bring the kids, they could, but it was a parent engagement workshop and we give them an overview of why we're coaching the way we're coaching, that it is organized chaos. I was looking after it. I was the main, I was the head coach, so I was comfortable doing that. What we were trying to do, and again, what we were trying to do was to try and get more parents, more adults involved in the club, the children with the guinea pigs, and we needed their help. And that session that you would have seen, like just engaging them, if they wanted to be a coach, great. All they had to do was stay. And if they were staying, they couldn't sit on their own. So they had to talk to a friend or make a new friend or, you know, we would have obviously tea and coffee. And if you can have that, great. But in the hall, it was just a matter of coming down. It was an hour, bish, bash, bosh, done, 45 minutes, in and out. Um, and it was that community element that we wanted to bring in. The parents are vital. If if you're, it goes back to the, what I said, nothing without us, nothing with us without us. And the parents are the biggest one because if you get the parents on side in terms of coaching and especially at the youngest age group, you have them. You have them as coaches or administrators or just as supporters and volunteers. And you're building up your army of volunteers. And that's so important in clubs. Um, so that support is vital, Aidan. And um, parent workshops, getting them involved, asking their opinion, you know, try and involve them as much as you can. And even just chatting to them during the sessions, going over and asking them, how are you? How are things? You know, you're creating that element of that bit of social relationship and, you know, that connection with the parents. Because you have that connection with the children that they're coming, but that connection with the parents is so important. Fernando, thanks. Uh, Paul's asking, just to, he's asking there, is, is there such a thing as different coloured size, three or four footballs uh, or junior sitters for different gameplay? I suppose ones like the Tuscan balls and that for the football yeah. are, are fantastic. Um, yeah, them them tough skin balls, and you know, um, people have used them to their class, and I got we got them in America as well, and we use them with Osergy, and they're great because you can squeeze them down, stick them in your pocket, pick them back out, and then they blow back up again. So um, as long as the equipment is safe, depending on the age group, Paul, um, softballs, balloons are great. Um, small balls, bean bags, balloons. Uh, soft tough skin balls um, some of the equipment that I have I've used scars, I would use towels rolled up in a ball and tied in a knot, my mother-in-law I kind of have a lot of her towels in my bag in the office that I use for workshops um, and again that's great for kicking and it's safe if they get hit with it it's not really going to hurt them socks, football socks um, putting one sock in and then squeezing it down and making making it like a little um, kick ball so you're holding it kick it back and then it comes back to you so you don't have to run after it um, and again just use your imagination in terms of the equipment um, but if another one especially for children is getting them to bring their favourite piece of equipment with them um, make sure that they keep it with themselves or they write their name on it or if they're not using it they give it to their parent or the coach but that's that's important because then if you go back to looking with the, working with the parents and that deliberate practice at home if they're using their favourite piece of equipment and the parent knows that and, you know, the parent is staying at your sessions and the parent's aware of, OK, this is what you did at this session, so we're going to play it at home. So then when they come to the next session, you know, they've had a little go, had a little practice. If they have, great. If they haven't, there's no issue with that. But again, it comes back to creating that element of play with the parents, communication with the parents and that practice and deliberate practice at home. So because like you only have them for a certain length of time. 
So using things of that socks, rolled up towels, scarves at home. It doesn't have to be a ball. And you know, obviously if if telling parents you have to buy a ball, that's like that's unfair. Um, but using the equipment as best you can, what you have, as long as they're safe, then use whatever they want. They can do skill acquisition, they can do anything with a pair of socks. <laughs> so using your imagination, but getting them to kind of have a think about what they could use at home or or how they could can I help their own practice? Excellent. We, we have a good question there from Hall then. So have you experienced much resistance from coaches when you've tried to encourage them to introduce more elements of play in the practice sessions? And more importantly, how did you deal with that? Uh, <laughs> really good question, Michal. Um, Yes is the best answer we can give. Push back in the sense of not, not that they didn't want to do it. It was the fear element and um, again, me being confident in doing it was how I coach, so I was easy to demonstrate it and I said, listen, I'll take a session of 40 or 45 kids. I, like, have been, my, our work with us or GA, we would have had in-service with parents for so many weeks and we would have been um, ways of how to structure your session, you know, making up the groups and all that. so I can control that amount of children um, through play and that's very difficult for other coaches. But in terms of the play element, um, just getting them to think about, listen, ask them a question. Just say, how does this make you feel? Or are you enjoying this? That's communicative play. That's social play. You're creating that little bit of a connection. So rather than say, listen, if it's me kicking the ball to Anton, Anton kicking the ball to me, me kicking the ball to Anton, that's a drill. And if you want to drill, can it go to B&Q? But that element then making that a game is me trying to go past Anton. So playing touchdown tag. Or every time I pass the ball to Anton, we get a point, and then we're playing against me, all and Paul, who are doing the same thing. But the more points we get, then Paul and me, are doing the same thing. So that's play element. But we're thinking about our skill level. We're bringing in a bit of competitiveness into it. But we're also problem solving. So distance, kind of trajectory, power, all of that comes in without even telling them. Um, and that sense of if you're not comfortable with that, if you're not comfortable with posing those questions, ask the group. Put them in their groups and ask them, okay, well, okay, I don't really know what I'm doing here. I just like wearing the swag, like wearing the gear. What are you going to do? Can you make up a little game? Everybody has to be involved because we're all going to make up our games. I'm just going to watch and I might ask you a question about how to change a game. Or you might tell me how you might change the game. You're watching, you're observing, you're the you're the bit of crowd control because you're making sure they're safe, but you're watching how they're learning, how they're interacting with each other. And when that happened, that was a bit of a game changer because they saw that no matter, like this was three and four year olds sometimes doing this as well as adults. So they could see that how much leeway, it's not all about kind of free play and freedom. It is freedom to a certain extent, but the main element is that they're safe, but that they have to be involved in their own learning. So questioning is the biggest one. Um, and getting them to make up their own activities games. It doesn't have to be a 3v1 game, just a, a certain little uh, throwing into a beanbag or what Anton's daughter did, you know, um, a target game, making sure that they hit the target, they get a point, and that's a game, and that's them, you know, through play, through collaboration. So it takes it takes a bit of patience and fairness, we all, um, having a plan, a rationale for why you're doing it. But again, if you bring them along in that journey, if you involve them, if you ask the parents questions and say, well, why do you think we're doing this? What is the point of that? Rather than saying, here's what we're doing. That's it. We're doing this. They need buy-in. They need to be involved and had owner, have ownership of it. So, you know, having them not come up with the idea, but, you know, being involved in the process is very important. And that definitely helps in terms of planning and putting in development plans as well. So um, buy-in is, is big on that. Yeah, I think I think even on that's important. Like even from my own perspective, still playing uh, for the club. If if your if your coach comes in and he says, "Hey, look, lads, we need to work on some sort of attack and movement here in the forward line. We'll do it from sideline ball and we'll do it from long range freezing. And here's how we're doing it. Yeah. it. It's exciting to an extent because you're hurling. But if he said to us, lads, why don't you three or you six go away and make up a few movements? It is the most exciting thing yeah. you can do in a training session because the next thing you know, you've created all these different set pieces. You're trying them out in challenge games. You're trying them out, and it, it just becomes it just becomes your own. So I suppose 
it's even the same with senior players as it, as it is with the likes of yeah. your under sixes or your under tens. The more you involve them, give them that ownership, the better. Um, no, but, and, and that's better. That it just goes back to that problem solving, Anton, and that kind of that as you talked about, problem setting that problem, setting that question, and seeing what happens. But again, it doesn't have to be through. It could be just about them thinking, making decisions, problem solving. It doesn't have to be actually a physical play issue. That's where the social play, community play, and the question comes in. That's the easiest one to do. In fairness, is just ask them a question, and seeing what happens, and seeing what answer you get. Yeah. Folks, is there any more questions for a one there? Will we have them? Sean, Sean, do you want to? I don't know if you can unmute. Can Sean unmute himself? No, he there? can't. No, he can't. So if he wants to type in, if you if you can, Sean. Um, and I just want to touch on that while, while Sean is typing in um, on your. Uh, that element of giving the players ownership and, and as you talked about an, an adult and Steve Kerr, Chicago Bull winning NBA player as well as now hugely like, successful NBA winning coach. That's what he does. Sergio Labrosial has done that with his players is asking them, okay, well, here's the tactic that we're going to do. So can you come up with it? Or why are we doing this? Or what's the problem here? Can you fix it? And like that's fair. That's with elite performance, high performing coaches and players. And you can do that with three-year-olds as well as adults. And it's about giving them that freedom because once they cross that wide line or once they cross the line in the basketball court or whatever game they're playing, you as a coach have very little control over that. So if you're not giving them that decision-making process and involvement in their own learning, then how are they going to um, come up with different scenarios and change the game to in terms of tactics and making sure that they're making their own decisions and how to change and how to make sure that you know, they are helping each other. You know, if a game's not going well, resilience and all of that comes into just that little thing of asking. I suppose while we're, uh, while we're still waiting, John typing on there, um, I, I'll ask you a question. What, in regards to, I suppose, imagery, right? Um, when you set up the imagery for kids and obviously you're set in the scene. So if you remember back in the day when we were we were coaching with Ulster, the the hall might have been an ice rink. Uh, and the next thing you know, then you're asking them to maybe do different kind of ice skating moves or whatever. But really, they're doing the squats and they're doing the lunges and, and all that involved. What has been maybe the most. The most drastic thing you've done regarding imagery where you may have dressed up or you, just for a bit of crack here until John's finished his question. Um, so, um, like the Jungle Book and Disney, but puppets. Um, Jeannie that you see here. Uh, so Jeannie kind of came about as a behaviour management tool. There was one uh, little fellow in particular in one of my schools who was getting all the attention because of his behaviour, his challenging behaviour. And I was forgetting about all the other children and what they were doing. I was making, just making sure he didn't flip out, in fairness. Um, but the puppets was great, and I thought um, it goes back to the Department of Education when they were doing uh, the kind of um, you and me play together and, and the respect and differences that came in and the uh, cartoon advertisements and the puppets and like, a couple of teachers on the call would remember all the um, those people going in and doing respect and differences through using puppets. And it was a complete game changer. Now, extremely difficult in trying to coach with a puppet. I normally have a, have a second puppet called Skip. But they don't see me with a pup with my hand up a puppet. <laughs> they see the actual puppet. They think the puppet is talking to me. Yeah, and this is Anton. Do you remember Anton? But Jeannie is always very shy. So if the if the children start laughing at Jeannie, Jeannie goes to sleep and Jeannie won't come back. And then it comes back to behavior management. So respect and differences, uh, that imagery and that sense of connection with the children and connection with something different. And it was an absolute game changer in terms of behavior management. Not only for the children, uh, for some adults as well. I would use Jeannie in a few props. Head the ball would be one happy and sad face, one end or the other. If I'm not getting what I want in a workshop, I'll turn head the ball around to sad face and I'll say, listen, if I don't get what I want from you, you're failing this course. And that's it. <laughs> now, head the ball doesn't be sad at the end of the session. Um, but again, it's just that kind of behavior management and that hostage negotiation and constant turn and throwing and imagery and Disney and you talked about the ice rink and snow paths and using the jungle book and moving like your favorite animal and using your favorite equipment. 
you're creating that sense of wonder and that sense of exploration and anticipation and that love for the sport, love for the game, love for your coach, love for your club. And it is so, it's invaluable and it's priceless. You know, and as we have seen it in our own coaching and, you know, if you're confident enough to do that, great. If not, just put on an iPad, put pictures and just so, okay, what do you see here? And I have pictures of four-year-olds doing the punt kick, but I also have a, a Bernard Brogan doing the exact same in no Ireland final. No difference. And the skill and the picture is no difference, but it's that imagery of saying, well, I'm four, so I can do that. And here's what it looks like in all Ireland final. And there's the imagery as well. Um, but again, it takes a little bit of time in terms of getting to that standard. But again, that fact of you can do this, take your time, have patience, you know, and work through it as well. Yeah, I think that's interesting. Like you're saying about using pictures there, what I found in Belfast, unfortunately, um, considering where we're at at the minute in Belfast with GAA, if I showed kids a picture of Bernard Brogan, they probably wouldn't know who he is. Uh, so so watching him maybe jump to catch a ball or whatever, whereas if I showed Super Mario come up to catch yeah. the ball, yeah. you know, energy complete through the roof. And what you'll find is Super Mario actually jumps with his knee yeah. uh, up in the air and stuff like that. So kids love that. Sean's came back now, Sean. Um, Sean's saying there, look, could you ask him if he's any good ideas or techniques for games that coaches can use yeah. online? Um, they've, now, Mel came in to ask the same question. He said that they're having trouble getting the under 10 girls to engage with Zoom coaching sessions. Uh, they don't like being on the camera. So, uh, again, shameful plug. <laughs> with Dublin GA, we finished up our uh, Fitness for Alex, um sessions. They're all on YouTube uh, for under 8s, 10s, and 12s. And it's done through, it's like a bingo. Um, uh, some of our kind of inter county players are involved, but they we couldn't see the children. They could only see us and they could only see the live videos. Um, it's done through animal movements. It's There's a little bit of uh, chores and stuff in that. They have to clear their bedroom, depending on what number uh, they come across. Um, they have to help out their friends or they have to help out their families at home. And that element of kind of just having a go at something, and it doesn't have to be, you know, um, trying to do skills off the wall. There's so much stuff. There's... Uh, I know the Ulster GA, Denny, GC2 coaches have great stuff in terms of the YouTube channel. It's the exact same. Um, online sessions, different skills for different age groups. Um, and that element of just keeping them at it and making sure that, you know, they're they're enjoying it. I would actually say, kind of going back to, again, Anton's daughter. I apologize, Anton. I've said so much about your daughter today, but just that video resonates again in terms of this question is, you know, why don't that on, the under 10 girls group engage them? The, okay. Can you send us in a video of your favorite game? Now, if they don't want to be on the camera, then why don't they get one of their parents to actually do the game? They've made up the game, the parent or some an adult in their in their house, they come up with the game. Um, and then you're they're being little mini coaches, then off camera, they're practicing that game and they're playing and they're playing that activity. Um, but there's loads of stuff online, fitness products, also GA, and they're all recorded, all on YouTube. Just a matter of sending them the link. Um, if you want me to send it on, I will. It's on our YouTube channel. And Ulster G, I know Ulster G have it on their YouTube channel too. So just copying the link, send it on to them. And then let just seeing how they get on and ask them that question. Don't need to see your videos, but how did you get on? Did you enjoy it? Did you change things? Did you make it your own? Um, did you use a different piece of equipment? You know. For another one, thanks. Um, I think I think we'll leave it up there because I think it was the questions. It's probably the last couple of questions we had in. Um, so Luke, I want just to thank you for your time. Uh, it was good seeing you again. Uh, it's been a while. So look, uh, if anybody has any other queries, feel free to get in touch with me. I can pass them on to Owen. Uh, or alternatively, we'll send you out the presentation uh, and the, the video later, uh, maybe tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so look, thanks everybody for coming on tonight. It, it's been a pleasure to have you on, uh, and hopefully we get you up maybe for a practical uh, some stage down the line. Definitely, there's no point in talking about it unless you can't do it as well. So I'll be class, Anton. Brilliant. Folks, thanks, thanks for listening. As Anton said, um, you can contact me. My email address is on the presentation as well. You can contact me, and there's a few resources that if you want, I'll send on. Um, and again, thanks for thanks for having me on, Anton, and I uh, really appreciate it. And stay safe, everyone, and take care. Thank you.